All right, so now we are recording. Uh, and also another quick note, uh, in order to get CLE credits, you'll have to figure out to, to fill out the attorney affirmation that I sent out last night. Uh, if you didn't receive that, I'm gonna put my contact information in the chat. Uh, and also at the end of the program, I will share that information again. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our executive director, Abja Midha, uh, to introduce the program. Thanks, Pete, um, and welcome everyone. My name is Abja. I'm the executive director of Volunteers of Legal Service and excited to see so many folks on the Zoom today for an incredibly important and timely topic, um, cultural competence and humility in pro bono practice. Um, really quickly, for those who are not as familiar with Volunteers of Legal Service, we have been around for over 35 years um, and we partner with community organizations, law firms and corporations to help meet the civil legal services needs of New Yorkers. We have quite a number of projects um, I, working with different communities, focusing on a range of issues from uh, immigration to life planning to small business. Um, and you can see the full list here. And with all of the work that we do, we train and we mentor pro bono attorneys from law firms and corporations to be able to meet the legal needs of our clients. I will turn it over now to Julia. My name is Julia Curry, and I am a staff attorney with Microenterprise. I'm going to let my colleagues introduce themselves as well. Hi, I'm Imran Hossein. I'm a staff attorney for the Microenterprise Project. I'm Emma Morgenstern. I'm the Immigrant Justice Corps Fellow and a staff attorney with the Immigration Project. So today we're going to be talking about pro bono skill building. And specifically, we want to uh, start out by introducing you to the twin concepts of cultural competence and humility. Then we want to help you understand that cultural competence and cultural humility are part of your professional obligation. So it's important to understand that and then reflect on what you bring to the table. Next, we're going to discuss the best practices for client-centered work and end with giving you some resources if you want to go over this in your own free time. Turn it over to Julia. Thanks, Imran. So cultural competence is the ability to adapt, work, and manage new and un unfamiliar cultural settings. So the United States is home to over 350 languages and has a high percentage, over 13% of the population born outside the United States. This means we're living in an increasingly diverse and evolving society. And as a legal profession, this also means attorneys have to become culturally competent to effectively serve their evolving and diverse clients. It is also a matter of professional obligation in supporting, your, in supporting cultural competence in legal practice. So for example, New York Rule of Professional Conduct 1.1, competence. A lawyer shall provide competent representation to a client. Competent representation requires the legal knowledge, skill, thoroughness, and preparation reasonably necessary for representation. Moreover, under the comments, of New York Rule of Professional Conduct 1.3, diligence, explains that a lawyer must also act with commitment and dedication to the interests of the client and in advocacy upon the client. And Emma will take over from here for a little bit. We also wanted to introduce you uh, to a brand new formal opinion that was issued just on March 10th in 2021. So this is an ethical obligation that is hot off the presses um, and it's specifically addressing the importance of virtual lawyering and some rules that people need to abide by as we're now pretty much all practicing virtually and maybe uh, continuing doing so into the future. Um, and this is a really crucial and important part of inclusive lawyering and in, in practicing in order to eliminate bias. So we just wanna draw your attention to these two parts of this rule. We are including the full uh, formal opinion in the packet that went out um, today or yesterday, I believe. Um, and we just want you to know that especially when practicing virtually, lawyers must fully consider and implement reasonable measures to safeguard confidential information and take reasonable precautions when transmitting such information. So this is gonna be really important in terms of client communication. We're gonna talk a lot more about this later, uh, but just thinking about the methods that you're using to store and um, client information and communicate with your clients uh, and having that be the best possible method that your client is comfortable with. Lawyers practicing remotely must fully consider and comply with applic applicable ethical responsibilities 
And this is going to include technological competence, diligence, communication, confidentiality, and supervision. Uh, so we are going to talk more about communication and confidentiality and diligence uh, throughout this presentation, but I want to draw your attention specifically right now to technological competence, uh, which is now a duty that we have as attorneys. So if you are one of the many attorneys like me at the start of the pandemic who had a really difficult time editing a PDF, now is the time to really dig into a YouTube video about how to do that, because we both need to be able to do so and also communicate with clients around how to do so. We're going to be working with people who run the full spectrum of, of communications and technological capacity from people who work in IT and are going to be teaching you ways to communicate because you're not necessarily as informed as they are, to people who have never heard of an application before, let alone an Adobe scan app that's going to help them scan their documents for you. So having enough a technological competence is going to enable you to explain those concepts and how to use them is going to be crucial and actually part of your ethical obligation as an attorney. And with that in mind, we really want to draw your attention to the fact that cultural competence and humility are part of your professional obligations um, as an attorney to be competent and to deliver effective counsel to your clients. So this isn't just a feel good idea that we're introducing to you today. This is a professional responsibility that we have as attorneys that you need to have com comfortability with in order to provide competent representation. And part of this is understanding your own identity um, and understanding your own identity in relation to that of your clients. Uh, you're not going to be able to communicate effectively with your client around their circumstances and their life if you're not able to fully understand your own identity. And without being able to do so, your representation is actually going to fail to fulfill your ethical obligations as an attorney, which is why we're really glad you're joining us today. And with all that in mind, I'm going to turn it over to Imran for a little bit of self-reflection. Oh, thanks, Emma. Um, before I, we start on this topic, on this topic, you know, I was before I started at Bulls, I actually worked at a big firm, and um, one of the things that I noticed was, you know, I, I feel like um, when we when pro bono attorneys take on work, I'm always amazed by the level of commitment and passion with which people do it, um, which with uh, attorneys take on these projects. I think one of the things that's occurred to me being on both sides of, you know, you know, working at Bowles and then having worked at a firm is that um, the clients are very different in their concerns, their needs, how to interact with them. And one of the most important things I think in this line of work that I have come to realize is it's always important to put yourself in the client's shoes more so than you would um, for any other a paying client. And I think that's always important to remember uh, when, rep when representing a, a pro bono client. So with that, uh, we're gonna go over two exercises that I think are gonna help illustrate these points. So, you know, if anyone can put in the chat or raise their hands um, virtually, I guess, uh, how do you feel with encounters with the following groups of professionals? Doctors, dentists, therapists, lawyers, financial advisors, and police officers. Feel free to drop it in the chat or, um, you know, have a share it in the chat. So I, I can start out um, and not to make light of the situation, but, uh, you know, I remember when I went to the a dentist's office a few years ago and I've never really been, or I'll, I'll, I'll start with, uh, doctors equals scared. I feel threatened when interacting with police officers. So these are all very valid answers. And, you know, in my example, I was going to speak about how when I went to a dentist's office, I was the first time I had an operation, it was very, very painful. And ever since I've had a natural aversion to anything dental related. And anytime a dentist tries to give me advice or tells me something, I'm always a little skeptical because I don't necessarily know if I want to endure um, what's about to come. So, you know, like people have said in this chat, uh, they feel threatened when encountering police officers. Just like in my case and in these instances, not everyone's interaction with an attorney has been positive. We're in a unique position because attorneys are our supervisors. They're our friends. We've been to law school with them. 
So we might have a natural empathy towards attorneys or a natural um, ability to, or a natural inclination to empathize with an attorney, but that's not going to be uh, your client's interaction. That may not have been your client's interaction uh, with an attorney. So when you're thinking about how a client might view you or, or how, when you begin your interactions with a client, you really want to put yourself into their position and think, what has been their past dealings with an attorney? Is there any chance they might have some skepticism of what I'm saying? And then work to overcome those things so you can uh, represent them to the fullest degree. So the next exercise I want to get into is um, how have you ever been have you ever gotten lost on the way to an uh, to an appointment and been late as a result? What if you don't understand what someone's saying? Have you ever felt like you're um, being mistreated or harmed? What if you can't afford something a service? Are you ever afraid to ask a dumb question when you're speaking with a professional? And have you ever gotten to the point where you feel like a problem and not a person? Again, feel free to drop in the drop in the chat or um, you know raise the mic. And I can sort of example of this as well. So recently, I had to help my spouse uh, roll four hundred one k to a, a rollover IRA and had to deal with a financial advisor. And I had gotten my own IRA in the past and didn't really remember that much of what was said at the time. So it was you know, afraid that I might be judged by the financial advisor if I asked questions that I'd asked in the past or afraid that I might ask stupid questions in general. And fortunately, I was in a position of having a very helpful financial advisor who's very open. And it's just important to keep in mind that there might be instances where clients don't feel so comfortable in your presence. And that's sort of the process of building trust, but being open to their experience and what might be going on with them and whether or not this is a new experience or not. Um, is very important in this process. Yeah, and to, to kind of second Julia's point, um, that's an excellent you know example where someone might be afraid to ask uh, a question. And, and again, it's always very important to put ourselves in the client's um, shoes and to understand why, you know, you want to get, you need to get a certain amount of information out of the client so you can, uh, successfully represent them but if they feel like I don't want to ask a question that I need to ask so I can give uh, the best information possible out of fear of sounding dumb or wasting time then it's on us to understand that that might be something that the client is feeling and more so moreover I, I get calls all the time scheduled calls where the client will tell me I'm sorry for taking up your time. I don't like, I don't mean to take up too much of your time or, you know, I hope I'm not a burden. And um, it's different because, you know, they're not paying for services. So at times they can feel that um, you're doing a service for them and you're not getting anything out of it. And, and for us, it's about helping. It's about doing the right thing. And we feel a natural gratification to because of that. So um, I think, you know, we have to make them feel like we're here for them and we want to be there for them. And it's an honor and a, a privilege to work with them. So now that we've sort of done those exercises, I want us to actually get into the weeds of this and, and think a bit about it. And, you know, so first, when we think about self-reflection, think about why you're doing this work. What brought you here today? What are your prior contacts with systems like this? Maybe you haven't done a lot of pro bono work and in light of recent events, you're, you're inspired to get involved with it. Maybe you've done a ton of pro bono work and you, um, you, you, you have a full range of experience. But everyone's different. It's always important to think about why you're doing what you're doing and then to check your assumptions about who your client is and what they need. This is one of the biggest things because, and you know, we, for one of my clients, there was one time where uh, the client, I, I read the file and I thought I needed to explain the high level all the way down to the nuances of the law. And when I first started speaking to her about uh, commercial real estate, she actually understood the law very, very well. Rather, she was looking for someone to bounce ideas off of, to serve as a, a thought partner who could maybe help her think of things in a different way, as opposed to someone who's going to explain the nitty gritty laws to her, the nitty gritty legal details to her. 
So that's where that's something where you know my assumption was wrong about the the client's case. In the same vein, it's important to stay flexible because in that instance, I didn't have much legal explaining to do. It was more so discussing how she wanted to do things, run her business, etc. But at times you do have to say you have to stay flexible because at times you do have to explain uh, the high level all the way down to the nitty gritty laws and 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 how the laws intersect with their situation and influence um, you know their decision making. So it's incredibly important to stay flexible in that sense and and not allow your preconceived notions about who the client is, where they're from, um, distract you from the facts or distract you from representing them to the best of your ability. And the last thing I, I wanna say, and, and then this is very important, the clients are the drivers of their story. They're the ones who know, who know all the answers to their story, have um, all the information you'll need for representation. So if you don't know something, you really gotta ask. And when you ask, um, you know, I think there's a tendency, am I asking too far? Am I asking too much? But if it's in the course of representation, put yourself in the client's shoes and ask using empathy and care and respect. That's, that, that's the way I think to go about getting information and, and always keeping that in mind uh, when, things, when you think things might get uncomfortable. So cultural humility, um, you know, the NIH, National Institutes of Health, uh, defines cultural humility as a lifelong process of self-reflection and self-critique, whereby the individual not only learns about another's culture, but one starts with an examination of her or his own beliefs and cultural identities. So the thing here is you really want to start with examining your own background. Everyone comes from a, uh, a different, or everyone comes from uh, an environment, an upbringing, a family, a community, goes to school, et cetera. And that all colors the way they see the world. Uh, that colors how we make judgments, that colors a lot. And once you start reflecting on that and understanding that your background has an influence on how you see things, then you can start collaborating with the client on their needs. And I'll explain more so on the next slide. So I think cultural humility is really the awareness of your own background and your own, um, you know, your own, uh, how you see the world and how your ex past experiences color your, your uh, decision-making vision. Cultural competence is the awareness of that and the acceptance that other people are gonna have different views, ideas, and their background is gonna impact the way they see things. And then that's not gonna be, uh, that might not always be the way you do. So, you know, it's recognition that people of different that cultures may have different ways of communicating, behaving, interpreting, and problem solving. And the recognition that cultural beliefs and behaviors may impact a client's legal beliefs and interaction with legal professionals. So I had a um, client recently who she, she, the only time she had dealt with a real estate attorney was the landlord. I was, I was, the client is a tenant and she was dealing with the landlord. The landlord's attorney was not, um, it was a very adversarial relationship. And you could tell when I had first, I, when I'd first spoken to her, I could be, I sensed that there was some skepticism on her part on the role of an attorney. What are, what are you trying to get out of this? What is, um, you know, at one point she asked me, why are you doing this if, if it's all, you know, not, if it's not paid for, et cetera. So, you know, there was a natural sense of skepticism and, I really had to work with her to make her understand that I'm on her side. I, I'm, I'm listening to her. She's in the driver's seat of this representation. And she, I want, I want, what I want for her is the best outcome that she wants for herself. So once um, she had understood that, she was able to open up and we had a really good, we still have a really good relationship. Um, and, but had I not understood that, you know, had I fallen back on my, potential, if I not use the culturally, culturally aware and competent approach, I may have thought, hey, you know what, the attorney on the other side, they might be, um, you know, I might try to empathize with them and I might try to act in a way that uh, isn't necessarily cognizant of the fact she had a bad relationship or a bad experience with that attorney. So I think it kind of speaks to the last point where cultural competence 
also includes an ability and willingness to adapt the way one works to empathize with the client's cultural background in order to provide the highest quality legal assistance. So implicit bias, I wanna speak about implicit bias before I turn it over to Emma. Implicit bias is the unintentional or unaware act of grouping persons or things into categories that can lead to discriminatory behaviors. The danger of implicit bias lies in the lack of self-awareness, but it can present itself and allow discrimination, not only in situations of conflict, such as in litigation, but also in situations without conflict, such as interactions with clients. Implicit bias can lead to a lack of effort and sometimes a violation of an attorney's duties of diligence and competence by imposing past experiences or expectations rather than the client's individual wishes and desires. Most importantly, implicit bias can lead to a deterioration of the requisite trust and comfort between a client and an attorney. So I think this is really important to consider and remember because oftentimes Implicit bias is not negative. It's not done out of malice. It's not done, um, you know, it doesn't happen in a way that, uh, you know, has a, has a malicious intent. Oftentimes it can be benevolent and you can be doing things uh, for the good of someone and your implicit bias can come out in a way. And I have an example in my own representation. I had a client who I reviewed his file. And when, as soon as I saw it, as soon as I saw the legal need, I had formed a story and I felt like I knew what the right legal solution was. I was like, okay, you know, this is the path I want to go down with him. And uh, I know, I know that this is like, I, I had, I had a game plan and I presented that game plan to him. And I said, you know, the worst case, if we take this approach is that you're, you're, you have to dissolve your company, et cetera, et cetera. And then he kind of turned to me, you know, very quickly. He's like, thank you for that. However, I can't dissolve this company because it's required. My, my business partner has a, visa, has a pending visa and this company is imperative for him obtaining that visa. So that's not an option. And again, I had to remember that the client's in the driver's seat. The client has a goal in mind. And that was a big, major lesson for me because it taught me that I have to ask the client what their goal is first before considering my own thought process and my own taking my own biased accounts into things. What I think might be the best solution might not be what the client thinks is the best solution or the best outcome. And it's important to remember that they know what's best for them. And that's, you know, removing your bias from the situation. So it's something important to remember. It's a lesson I always keep with me. And I'm, I'm going to turn it over to Emma for who's going to speak about traumas now. Great. I'm going to start out talking a little bit about manifestations of trauma in the body. Um, and it's not the focus of our presentation today. This could be its own presentation, its own series of presentations. It's a huge topic. But understanding the way that trauma can impact one's body um, and can affect a client representation is really important and is part of culturally competent representation. So I'm going to go over some of the physical manifestations. There's some helpful terms on the right side um, of the slide that if you want to take a look at that later, do a Google, refer to some of the further materials, uh, I would highly recommend doing so. But here's just a brief uh, introduction to some different ways that you might see trauma manifesting um, in a client's behavior or in your own behavior. So some ways that you might see uh, impacts of trauma coming through are through a person's body language. It might manifest in a stillness or a lack of affect. Someone could be talking to you about something that is beyond your imagination, is extremely terrible to even think about. And they could be doing so with a really flat demeanor. Um, and this could be a symbol of dissociation. It could also be a symbol that this is a story that they've been required to tell that this conversation they're having with you is not necessarily the first time they've had to go over this really terrible thing that happened to them. And that might just be the way that they're currently coping with it. So don't take anything away from a lack of emotion when someone is telling you something that's really difficult to talk about. Um, a lack of apparent emotion, because that doesn't necessarily mean that it didn't happen to them. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're not feeling the impact of it in that moment. You might also see it uh, through physical agitation. Uh, someone might start crying and not be able to stop or have a hard time sitting still and fidgeting. 
back when we were doing client interviews in person, we would have a little bowl that we would put on the table with a fidget spinner in it and a stress ball, which was helpful in those instances for people who need something to do with their hands while they're talking about difficult subjects. Obviously we can't do that now. So it's something to keep an eye out for um, and might be a symbol to take a break. People also might have difficulty um, maintaining eye contact throughout the course of a conversation if you're on a video call or if we're doing these in person again, you're in person. Um, and this could be a symbol of avoidance. These are also all things that it's important to try to clock and see if it's happening to you. Uh, a lot of lawyers have experienced traumatic events in the past. A lot of lawyers experience secondary and vicarious trauma just through the course of representation. And if you are someone who might be exhibiting some of these symptoms, it is important to talk to a professional about it. And it's also important to recognize that what's going on so that you can also take a breath, take a step back um, and do what you need to do to, to work around it or to come back to it at a later time. Some other physical manifestations of, of people who've experienced traumatic events um, can be through memory loss or gaps, which is something that's really difficult in legal representation because often we really need the specific information that someone has about something really awful um, that happened in their lives. We wanna know what time they woke up that morning, what they were wearing, what time they left the house, who they talked to, what exactly they said, what exactly was said to them. Sometimes this is information that might be really, really hard, if not impossible to get. Um, so if someone is having a hard time remembering, try not to get frustrated, try not to say, why don't you remember this? Like, wasn't it traumatic? <laughs> didn't, didn't it stick in your brain? Think about how this is actually a physical manifestation of trauma. Think about a way that you might be able to communicate that to an adjudicator if it is something that you do need to produce for the course of legal representation. But also take a step and think about whether or not this is information that you actually need. A lot of times as lawyers, we're trained to get all of the information that we possibly can out of someone because what you don't know might actually hurt this client further down the line. And, and you don't wanna be surprised in the course of litigation, which is very understandable. But there are times where someone is gonna disclose something to you that occurred to them in their life that might not be relevant to the representation um, an example from immigration is if you're renewing someone's work authorization document and they disclose something that is unrelated that they had they have a prior U visa application which is based on um, which is based on a crime that they experienced in their youth you probably don't need to dig into what happened in that incident and it's not necessary for them to go through that with you and it's not necessary for you to try to dig those details out so thinking about whether or not it's actually relevant to the representation at hand. Some other symbols that someone might be experiencing avoidance or you might be experiencing avoidance if you're reluctant to set an appointment or you're reluctant to show up or you're not wanting to work on a particular case or dive into a personalized affidavit. Your clients might also be missing or being late to appointments. Um, they might've been on video for a remote call and wanted to turn it off or not wanted to talk about something while you can see them. And these are also things that you need to check in with your client about. All of these uh, physical manifestations might be for some other reason, which is why, as Imran was saying, it's really important to continually check in with your client uh, to see what's going on for them, to see what might be motivating some of these behaviors, and to make sure that you're accounting for what might be um, some post-traumatic stress disorder or symptoms that someone has experienced trauma in the past. Um, and the last thing I want to say about trauma is that these are learned survival mechanisms that people have developed in order to keep their bodies safe. So it is extremely important to make space for them in the representation because your client has clearly done enough that they've been able to make it to you, to the legal representation that you're going into with them in this moment. And it's important to respect that and understand that these are rational responses to the triggers that people have experienced. And with that, we're gonna move into some best practices for working with clients. Um, we're gonna be talking about the actual tips that you came for today, understanding how past and ongoing experiences might impact the legal representation that you're working on. So the first tips that we're gonna have are around the idea of building trust with your client, uh, which is paramount to, um, to maintaining a legal representation that's gonna be effective for you and for the client. 
And the first tip that we have for you is treating all of your clients with respect, which might seem really basic, but you wanna be treating your clients with the respect that you would afford to your colleagues, to your supervisor, to your boss, to your mother, whoever is the person that you imagine who's at the top of that for you in terms of how much respect you're gonna exhibit, that's where you wanna go for your legal representation. As Imran was saying, our clients are the bosses of this legal representation. It's really important for them to be made aware of that at every turn and really important for them to feel that from your behavior toward them. It's really important that they get treated with the respect that a paying client would, would receive. And also, again, that outside of asking them to do your laundry, that they get treated like you would your mom. Um, with that in mind, showing empathy is really, really important. Uh, your clients might have had prior negative experiences with the agencies that you're interacting with, uh, with other attorneys or with the legal system in general. So you might have a lot to overcome in terms of making someone comfortable and building that trust and, and showing them why it's important to engage with the process that you're currently working on them with, working on with them. Um, I hate to be the person to break it to you if I am, but not everyone has exclusively good experiences with attorneys. So that is something that you might have to encounter and counter with your own behavior. Um, and starting with number one, again, respect is gonna go a long way towards doing that. Uh, harking back to the exercises that we did, it might be embarrassing or intimidating to seek help um, to display that type of vulnerability to show that you might have made a mistake that landed you in a situation that you need assistance with, or just to show that you don't necessarily know as much about something as someone else does. So a couple of tips that might help uh, with someone who's feeling that way about kind of overcoming that hurdle of, of going to someone who's a professional in something where they need assistance it's really important to ask people if they have any questions, not whether or not they understand you. And that is a way to simply make, to kind of take on the fact that the, the things that we're telling people and the legal advice that we're giving isn't always intuitive. The legal systems that we're working within are not always intuitive. So if you say, do you understand some, do you understand me? That is something that I know if I'm on the other side of that question, I always wanna say yes. When I've had a doctor say, okay, do you understand? My inclination is to say, absolutely. Don't, you don't need to worry about me. I totally get it. I'm not gonna mess this up. I'm not gonna completely disregard your legal advice. I mean, your, your doctor's advice as soon as I walk out of this office because I didn't understand you, even if that's what I mean. So if you ask someone, do you have any questions? I understand what I just explained, took a really long time. I used a lot of really, random words in a really strange order. So if you have any questions, this is the time to ask them. In particular, this thing is really weird. It gives up, it gives someone more opportunity to intervene with an area that they might actually need more clarification in. Similarly, asking someone what led to a choice as opposed to why they made it can help counteract feeling judged, which is definitely a feeling that I, I have when I go into an office with someone who is giving me advice about something. I don't want to feel judged for my choices. I don't want to feel like I didn't take care of my health or I didn't take care of my teeth if it's the dentist. Um, so asking someone, I know that you uh, ended up going back to that person who had displayed abusive behavior to you, um, and I know you were doing everything you could to keep yourself safe in that moment. Do you mind explaining to me what led to that decision? is going to give them more opportunity to bring you into their story as opposed to saying, why did you do this? Because they're already going to feel judged in that moment and they're going to feel like they have to justify their behavior to you in a way that's going to be uncomfortable and is going to not necessarily get the information that you need in a productive way. And with all that in mind, we want you to stay client-centered. Um, Imran talked a lot about this, but understanding what the client's motivation is for contacting an attorney. We are trained to be very linear. We have really keen ideas of what a successful legal, legal representation is going to look like, what winning a case looks like, um, what the end goals are that we're kind of programmed to, to just kind of head toward. Like We want to get to the end. We want to get that approval. We want to get that will signed. We want to get that lease signed. Uh, we want to finish reviewing these documents. But your clients may have different motivations and different priorities that are competing that it's really important to check in with them about so that you are aligning your goals with them because going back to the number one, they're the boss and you're there to serve their needs, not the other way around.
Next slide, please. So another, yeah, another thing that's really important is uh, thinking about the different challenges that someone might be facing in their life, um, which might be totally outside of and separate from the legal representation that you're engaging with. Uh, your clients may be juggling multiple responsibilities and obligations. They might now be a fourth grade teacher in their own home when that was not their job before. They might have five children that they're taking care of full time. They might have two different jobs. There are a lot of things that people are juggling right now in particular, and it is important to know where this legal rep representation is going to fit into their life and help someone manage those, those differing um, obligations. Clients might also be experiencing a personal emergency or a crisis, especially now. And they might have had a really difficult time seeking and obtaining legal counsel. Your representation with someone might be the end of a very long road where they've been trying to seek someone who can help them. And they might be willing to sacrifice a lot in order to keep you in their case. So thinking about uh, balancing that with your behavior and not, not taking up someone's time when they might be engaging with a personal emergency or crisis is really important. Your clients might also have a difficult time following your extremely salient and excellent legal advice. I know you guys are giving the best legal advice on the planet, but unfortunately, sometimes people just aren't able to make that a priority. Um, the legal advice might be that they need to stay away from someone who is really integrated into their life in a way that it's really difficult to do so. Um, they might need to find documents that you know, that they know they just like aren't going to be able to find. They can try their hardest to meet those goals. Your job is just to explain what the legal advice is and to explain the consequences if they can't meet those goals. It's not to make them do something that they can't necessarily do. We've talked a lot about this, but people might have a hard time keeping their appointments. Um, it's obviously important to, to lay those boundaries and to make it known what needs to happen in order to actually successfully undergo this legal representation. But at the same time, understand that if someone misses an appointment, it might be because they had a personal emergency or a crisis. It might be because something came up. It might be because they had those multiple responsibilities that we talked about. It might be because they're experiencing an avoided behavior. So coming to them with that in mind rather than frustration is going to get you a lot further. And finally, people might have a really hard time responding to and working with government bureaucracies. One of the first responses we got to the earlier questions was that people feel threatened when encountering police officers. That is a reasonable response to this government. A lot of people have had extremely negative interactions with the US government, which is a lot of what we're doing in the course of legal representation, going into buildings where people are checked by security guards who have weapons and they're going through a security metal detector, that's the word, um, and walking into a courtroom where they might've had really difficult interactions in the past. So understanding that people are coming to you with those past experiences and thinking about how you can try to help so make someone feel safe in something that can feel really threatening. And finally, before I hand it over to Julia, I'm gonna talk a little bit about communicating effectively, um, which brings back to uh, the formal opinion 498 that was issued last month. It is more and more important that we are thinking about this really critically because the way that we used to communicate was just call someone on the phone and bring them into the office. And those things are changing a lot right now. So. The first tip we have for you, um, which might be hard to read, so we're gonna give you these slides later, but you have to ask your client their preferred method and timing of communication, and also request that they update you if that changes. You might be working with a 17 year old who has never received a phone call in their life before. And if you leave them a voicemail, they're gonna be like, what was that? I've never been left a voicemail. I'm never gonna check that. I don't even know if I have a voicemail box. Um, you also might be working with someone who's on the older side. And if you say, do you have WhatsApp? They're gonna say, what's an app? You have to think about who you're working with and ask those questions up front. Um, I have a lot of clients who have an email address, but they never check it. So. The first question I ask after what's your email address is how often are you on there? And they might say, oh, uh, never, which can lead to a huge um, issue. If I don't ask that question, I send them an email. I'm like, why haven't they responded to me? I sent them an email three months ago and it's because they never check it. So checking in with them and making sure that you're being responsive to their needs is really important. Similarly, asking about their work schedules or other obligations 
is crucial. Um, again, people are juggling a lot of responsibilities and like, like we were talking about before, you might be the answer to a question that they've had for a long time. This legal representation might be really important to them. So if you have a client who's in college and you say, are you free at three? They're going to say yes, because they don't want to lose their lawyer, but they might have class at three. So if you're free at 11 and you're free at three, say, when do you have class? And when can we work this out so that you're not you're not sacrificing other things in your schedule for this legal representation. It's really important to explain legal terms um, and not to assume that your client understands just because they're not asking questions. I think we've gone over this, but you know, I'm using acronyms left and right. I talk about USCIS and ICE and SIG. And sometimes when I'm talking about a form, I just use the number as opposed to talking about the process. And I say, we're gonna put in an I-45 and that is meaningless to almost everyone. So you need to be ready to say, we're going to fill out a form I-485 together. That is a request for a green card. A green card is a request for lawful permanent residence. All of that is important and is, and is upfront. It's not something you wait to be asked to do. Uh, similarly, reviewing written documents orally. If you hand someone a contract, they're gonna say, okay, looks good, I'll sign. It's really important to go over every single paragraph and then explain what every single paragraph means. Um, and finally, be aware that your client might be accustomed to different communication styles um, in their professional or their personal lives. Um, they might be coming to you with a lot of formality. They might be coming to you with none at all. Try to meet them where they are and continue to treat them with respect. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Julia for more tips. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm going to go a little bit into client interviewing tips. Uh, starting with your initial meeting with the client. So before you jump into the nitty gritty of a representation in your first meeting, you'll want to do some ice breaking. So making sure that you, you know, ask them how their day has been and what's going on with them, you know, the weather, very idle chit chat, just to sort of make people comfortable. If you're pers in person, maybe offering water, again, that might be uh, far off in the distance, given our current circumstances, but just trying to make them as comfortable as possible. And as part of that, also, as you're leading into the meeting and the actual discussion, giving them a roadmap for what the, the meeting is going to look like, what, what you're going to discuss, um, what your goals will be, expectations, that sort of thing. And going into that, making sure that you're explaining your role carefully and managing expectations is really critical in this first meeting. So, you know, the role can be as simple as the scope of the representation. So, for example, for myself, uh, I do a lot of work with commercial leases and a lot of our uh, our work is constrained by uh, city funding. That means that I can only do transactional work. I can't do litigation. So being very upfront about that fact and saying, I have, I can represent you up until this point. If this dispute you know, resolves in uh, someone filing an action, I can no longer be your attorney. So that's sort of more logistical issue as to the actual scope of the representation. That's also a matter of setting expectations in, of your role as the attorney and their role as the client. So as we've talked about previously, the, the client is setting the, is setting the sort of course, they are steering the ship, but you, are, you have to explain to them that you are the, you're an advisor, you're an, maybe an expert, a counselor, a strategist, that sort of arm of the operation. You are setting out the options and explaining the consequences of those options in order for them to, in order to empower them to make informed decision, because ultimately they are the decision makers. You'll need to assess in that first meeting the need for an interpreter. Um, it may be that there hasn't been an opportunity uh, to uh, engage an interpreter or the client has indicated that they don't want an interpreter, but maybe that's because they haven't interacted in these kinds of systems before. And it might actually be necessary to engage an interpreter in order to explain certain legal concepts that aren't necessarily even that easy to explain in English. So it's important to assess that need on the first meeting. And it's also important to not make assumptions or judgments. We've, we've spoken about this previously in this presentation, but everyone's experience, every client's experience is going to be unique. Um, different clients will have different priorities. It's important to first get their story and ask them their thoughts, feelings, and goals for this representation. Um, it's important to avoid autopilot. You know, each person's experience are, are going to need, you're going to need to adjust your questions and conclusions based on their experiences and their priorities. Um, you should be asking open-ended questions. So if you're trying to get the overall story or narrative as you're going into this uh, initial meeting, 
you'll ask questions like, what do you mean by this? Then what happened? Letting them tell the story so you can get a narrative from A to B. And if you need more details, you know, maybe make a note of it. And as you're going through and getting, you feel like you have an overall picture, then going back to those questions and demonstrating that you've been listening actively by, by mirroring essentially what they've told, for example. Um, if there's an instance of, uh, uh, you know, so for example, in my cases, if uh, a client has told me in the course of the, that initial meeting that you know they've received harassing text messages from their landlord because they are they have rent arrears, I might go back to the client and say, you know, you told me you just told me that you know you recently received text messages from your landlord that were harassing. Well, what was the actual content of the, of those messages? Were there threats? Were there things like that? What exactly was said? It's also important to engage in grounding. So I've spoke about this a little bit in terms of leading into a conversation and leading out of a conversation. So you'll want to give an initial roadmap of where you're, where the conversation is going, and then as you are ending the conversation, it's you know important to give sort of a, sort of an overview of what's been discussed, going over the goals and expectations, and discussing next steps, and leaving room for the client to ask questions. So another issue we previously discussed is. Don't express entitlement to information. You know, always explain why you need to know something rather than demanding answers. It can be very alienating to you know, just demand uh, an answer to a question as opposed to explaining why you need that particular uh, answer based on the circumstances. And it, it's important to make sure that you're assessing their level of comfort when you're asking those questions because as we've noted, you know, this is as a trauma response, but also just sort of you know, a level of uncomfortability if someone is uncomfortable answering a question, you need to maybe explain it a little bit better and then they might feel a little bit more comfortable, understand, so that they can understand that you, that you have empathy for them. Um, you need to leave space for quiet. So you can be possibly asking very intense questions, very personal questions, very complex questions. And quiet gives them space and gives yourself space to process both the answer and also deal with any emotions that might be coming up or to maybe ask questions um, that they otherwise uh, wouldn't have time to, to consider. Um, you don't want to, as you're you know, exiting a meeting or um, even in the middle of a conversation, you don't want to leave someone in an agitated state. Um, you, leave, you, must, you should leave time to decompress. So if you've been asking very difficult personal questions, there should be an ability to transition out of the conversation to decompress. So asking what they have planned for the rest of the day or what they're going to do over the weekend uh, in order to sort of get out of that agitated state and into a more comfortable, regular space. We've spoken about this a little bit previously in terms of the ADA decision. It's really important to navigate technology access. So it's, you have to consider whether you need language access, what the client's literacy, both technological or whether they have access to laptops, phones with cameras, speakers, scanners, reliable internet, it's going to be different for everyone. Um, and there's also a possibility that maybe a household shares technology among family members and whether or not that affects confidentiality, that sort of thing. So taking into consideration what the actual access is and what the need will be for the individual client by being upfront about that in the meeting. You should acknowledge time restrictions, both your own time restrictions as well as the time restrictions of, of the client. So if you only have an hour that day, be upfront about that at the beginning of the meeting. You know, say, you know, I have until 2 p.m. I wanna make sure that we are very thorough. If we don't quite finish, let's find time next week or another day to finish our conversation. And similarly, if they have to leave, you know, acknowledging that they have time restrictions, if they have to keep the childcare pickup or, or they have another meeting with uh, you know, a business partner because they, you know, I do a lot of commercial leases or they have to meet with the super, that kind of thing. Making sure that you leave space for flexibility and openness in terms of finishing your conversation, meeting your goals of that particular conversation, but maybe it's on another date. You want to ensure that there is privacy and confidentiality. So it's important to explain <clears throat> why they need confidentiality and privacy. So many people may not have access to private rooms or uh, maybe they're taking care of child or they are taking care of a sick family member, but explaining the, the need for that privacy and confidentiality as well as sharing documents is very critical. Um, it's also important to be careful in asking if the individual is safe in their home. So 
something that I like to do if there is a circumstance that is a little bit um, unclear, making sure that people aren't speaking on the speakerphone. And then if they're maybe asking them in a yes or no question, whether or not they feel safe. Um, and then so for your own um, presentation and remote work, you know, if it's on video, considering what your workspace says about you, um, neutral is the goal, try to stay neutral as possible. Okay, so here is the code for the CLE also. So that's Reflect 2021. And I believe we're gonna put that in the chat. So just again, just leave it up for a second here. So that's Reflect 2021. And again, it'll be in the chat. So moving to troubleshooting We've talked about this already, but sometimes this clients miss appointments because of a crisis, they couldn't get time off work, or they didn't have transportation, or they didn't have childcare. Being flexible and sort of meeting the client where they are, understanding that it's important to make accommodations, that you should be persistent and follow up in different ways, whether it's text messages, email, phone, all of the above, making sure that you're making the effort to, to uh, make the time for them, but also not going overboard, right? There has to be boundaries. if if there isn't a, an ability to make an appointment, maybe someone's missed three or four appointments and maybe maybe right now isn't the time to pursue this, it, but keep in mind that they've, they've reached out, that this is, this at, at least at a time was a priority for them, but maybe things have shifted and they have to pursue it at a later time, but leaving it open to reach out in the future. Don't take it personally. Don't, don't assume the client isn't taking the case seriously. It's really, it's not about you, it's about them. Um, in terms of other issues of communication, uh, again, clients may or may not be accustomed to working with attorneys or legal terms. We use a lot of jargon, and it's important to explain things preemptively. They may understand, but it doesn't, they may understand a legal concept, but it doesn't hurt to, uh, to explain it, and they can, they can cut you off if they already understand. Um, obviously, during COVID, uh, meeting face-to-face -face is very difficult. There is a reality in some future where we can meet to face to face with our clients again. Meeting face to face is very important in terms of reading body language and you know making it helps with demonstrating your own empathy and your own body language and building trust. But again, uh, prohibitive circumstances at the moment. Um, as I already noted in the initial meeting, but also throughout the representation, it's important to set clear and reasonable expectations for both your role and the role of the client, as well as potential consequences. Um, I don't know if we've said this before, but you know, you're a helper, you're not a fixer, you're not, you lay out the options, you explain all the possibilities and the consequences, and they may or may not accept those solutions, but it's it's important to set the expectations in that way. Um, during long or very difficult conversations, it's important to take breaks. It can be very um, strenuous to sit uh, for in a long period of time explaining your story or explaining a concept going through an 80 page lease. Um, it, it, it's important to make space to um, process feelings, process questions, process terms. Um, it's also important to de-escalate difficult conversations. If you see that a client is becoming aggressive or um, defensive, maybe take a step back, say, you know, hey, I think that this is not a very productive line of questioning. So maybe we'll go back to it at a later time, but let's move on to this, this other um, piece of information. It's also important in that way, if someone is having a trauma reaction or is telling you something deeply personal and difficult to not react in a way that is stigmatizing. So something like, oh my God, that's the worst thing I've ever heard. Don't, don't say things like that. It's more so thanking them for you know sharing something like that with them, saying something like, thank you for trusting me to um, share that information. I know that must be very difficult or something along the lines of that. If the client is experiencing multiple crises, it's important to be patient and understand that clients have other priorities that may take precedence. Again, you don't feel the need to solve every problem the client has. You are a helper, not a fixer. Um, costs, you know, small costs might feel very large to someone with little money. So empathize with that. Consult with your pro bono counsel about your firm's policies on these costs. You know, a lot of our clients, many of our clients can afford things that maybe seem like small costs, but many cannot. So it's important to understand that though this case may be a priority, it might be, you know, cost prohibitive for them. And finally, we want to give you a few more resources for further inquiry. So you can look into these books. There's a podcast and a couple of videos that we think are really helpful um, in terms of uh, uh, further Pete is going to lead us out. 
th thanks, Julia and Imran and Emma. This was really fantastic. Um, so just a, a couple of quick housekeeping notes. Um, I put the information in the chat, but if you're interested in getting CLE credits for today, uh, please fill out the attorney affirmation that I sent out last night and email it to me. My email is in the chat and also the emails in the email that you received last night. Uh, so you should have that. And if you, you've misplaced that materials, feel, feel free to reach out to me um, and I will resend it to you. Uh, and also, if you could fill out the um, training evaluation form, that would also be very helpful to get your feedback. Um, so when we're thinking about future trainings, we are uh, responding to people's uh, needs, criticisms, and praise, I hope, as well. Uh, and, and finally, uh, you know, as Ab just said at the very top of the hour, uh, you know, our, our our goal is to, to serve the client community, but to serve the client community with the help of our pro bono partners. Uh, and so we have a number of different projects uh, that have pro bono opportunities. And if you are interested uh, in working with Falls or if you've already worked with Falls and you were interested in taking on more matters, feel free to reach out to me um, and, and, and we could try to set you up with, with something that will uh, both serve our clients and also, uh, you know, scratch that itch for you to do pro bono, which I think is so important. Uh, we are going to stick around for, uh, you know, we have a few more minutes. Um, if people have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Or also, uh, if you want to unmute yourself, uh, you could do that as well. You can also feel free to direct any questions you have to Pete afterwards, and he can answer mm -hmm. all of your cultural competence and humility questions. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for joining us. Or at the very least, loop in the, the wonderful trainers we had today. Uh, so, so again, thank you, everybody. Have a, have a wonderful afternoon, um, and we hope to work with you soon in the future. Take care. Oh, one last request for the CLE code. Sure. So the CLA code is reflect 2021.